How far? What time is it? 8.16. Oh, boy. I got your notification. All right. Let's go live and see what happens. So welcome, everyone. Uh, g'day, Aaron. How are you today? Hey, buddy. Doing good. Doing good. Now I've got to turn I off I see this. my delay. Oh, it's too funny. Is I'm it, all like is this. Is it still delayed? <laughs> <laughs> oh, probably. Welcome to Kung Fu Theater. <laughs> I'm Aaron Harrison. This is David Osler. Let we're us know, guys, what's Kung going Fu on because uh, we're having some Skype issues again. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's um, really interesting. I think what's going to happen is we're going to have to try something like um, Zoom or something. And there's a new Google app I was just talking to Aaron about. I was just having a look what it's called, uh, which I think it's called Meetings, I think. Let me just have a look. Uh, Let us know if you guys see lip sync off as usual. Uh, we can't figure it out. So yeah, it's called it must meet. be it's called meet. Okay, well we're gonna research other ways and try those and hopefully it'll work better. Yeah, because um, we just can't seem to solve it with this Skype issue. We were doing tests before that we came on. Uh, someone said laugh out loud, drag. Uh, am I out as well, or is it just Aaron that's um, out? Uh, Hello, let's... testing one, two, three, testing so audio sync. I'm out on my own freaking thing it's probably just my <laughs> stuff. i don't know even on my own camera through my own computer i'm off so now oh, who knows man god it's uh the, the thing is too it and it's coming in and out we were doing test uh the advanced saying go meet google meet is is really good aaron slow your lips down uh you sound like to catch up now do i sound okay jim is my audio okay because just curious to know uh, we're pretty certain that it's skype that's causing the issues here um slow my lips down so let us uh, know uh, I the, will the, try the problem to is talk slower. We, that don't work. We were trying before, and then one minute I was way out, and then I'd come in, and then I'd go out again. Like, it's all over the place. Uh, just Aaron is out. Yeah, it's got, it's got to be Skype, Aaron. But see, like, for me, you're, like, way off, like, back to the, like, you're, like, three seconds off, literally. Yeah, and they're saying... So maybe I'm, it's my place. They're saying here, Mark's saying it's called Audio Drift. Um, so they're saying that you're way out, uh, but I'm okay. Um how do I do this? I want to do a speed Jeffrey test. Jeffrey said F stoppers are st uh, having the same problems as well. David, your audio is fine. So, yeah, it's. Uh, Jeffrey said too much traffic. There may not be much we can do about it today. We're probably just going to go ahead, and unfortunately, <laughs> Aaron is just going to look like he's um, uh, not talking in sync. But next week, we're going to try and get something like um, Zoom or that Meet working. Um, I think Meet's available. Uh, in the US, but I'm not sure whether it's available in Australia yet, so we'll have to try it. And they're both free options, I believe, and you can do screen sharing and other things with those uh, as well. So that may be the way we have to go, Aaron, I think. What about this? Anybody that knows uh, things about internet speed, my upload is 13.30 Mbps. That's my upload. Is that like really ridiculously low? 13. My download is 153. No, that's not too yeah. bad, I don't think. 13 up. 153 down. Yeah, mine's uh, mine's around about uh, 80 or 90 down, but it's 30 up. Um, so it's it's faster than yours going upstream. But it could be just that with the virus at the moment that, that, that Skype particularly is getting slammed, and that could be the issue, that it just can't cope with demand. Hey, let's go with Carl's uh, comment. Press on. Let's move on. Yeah, Mike's <laughs> saying it's it's low. Uh, Van is also saying too slow. So, yeah, it's probably that from that side, I think. I did a speed test, and I was 100 megabits per second nearly up and th uh, 30, no, 100 down and 30 up. So um, I had plenty on my side, but yeah, who knows? All right, well, let's go. Let's continue anyway, Aaron. Um, because I, we've got a lot to get through today. <laughs> we were a Let's little bit it. late uh, due to the stuff that's going on. So I'm just going to start the uh, credits just to the show, and then we're going to start, guys.
Well, welcome everyone uh, back for our usual uh, Wednesday uh, show. It's Tuesday in the US, obviously. <laughs> I always, get, yeah. always have to say that because I confuse everyone. Everyone goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, coming I know, in, so a day off. Coming in with some new audio stuff this week, so I'm going to do a, a video on it. Um, just to explain to everyone that I had... Um, because I'm a musician and stuff, uh, I've had universal audio interfaces. They're very expensive interfaces, but they're more designed for uh, putting musical instruments in and things like that. Um, and I sold, well, it was a friend actually, um, a friend offered to take it off me because I wasn't using it enough. Uh, so I've sold that and then I bought a more uh, sort of YouTube-y type system that, that comes in together, which is the Pod uh, Roadcaster Pro and also this microphone. Uh, as well so it didn't cost me anything which was great because the money he gave me paid directly for this so it worked out Ooh. fantastic uh, but I'll have a, um, a talk about that in a separate video so how have you been Aaron? Been doing pretty good uh, been working uh, been hot uh, haven't quite you know I'm trying to get some YouTube content together but it's really hard when you're working six days a week but you know, I'm still working on YouTube stuff but it's, it's taken a long time to put videos up by the time like we do this show uh, the next week's already here and we're doing the show again. So it's like, oh my gosh, I didn't even put up a video. So just being busy, how about yourself? Yeah, well, I mean, not busy from uh, work side of things, but plenty of things that I've got to review and catch up on work and things like that, like catching up on weddings that I've been doing and things like that. And I've got a stack of gear that came in yesterday that I've got to review a, a lot of small Any gimbals? stuff. Uh, no, but there's some small rig stuff, which is great. So stay tuned uh, for that. I am Sweet. getting something in the gimbal rain uh, soon, though, coming in, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I it. I love this oh, comment. Carl has said, David looks like Heisenberg from Breaking Bad in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> I know. When we first got on, I wasn't looking, and I heard this deep voice like, whoa, what the heck's going on there? And I look up at the big microphone. Sounds all bassy and good stuff. But Sounds the thing good was, though, I was listening to it before. I mean, if you listen, let me switch because I'll, I'll just show you the between the two because this is the Rode mic. Now, this is the one that I was using, and it's the echo yeah. that I'm getting from that. Now, that's the how my yeah. audio was previously when I was doing the uh, any YouTube videos or shows, and, and I listen to both of them now, and I think, uh, you know, I'll just switch back. And I think now it, it's like chalk and cheese. And I thought, wow, it's because um, I yep. kept getting complaints from people saying I was getting echoing and I should be putting soundproofing and stuff in your rooms. And I couldn't be bothered to do all that. I mean, it's a studio. It's well, a, a working thing for clients to come in, you know. Well, the thing is with the, the audio, I mean, it wasn't that echoey. It sounds clean and clear and stuff. Uh, mine might be bad now because I did do all of the soundproofing, but it's on my other camera angle that I do usually. But since I'm working on the computer and showing you guys stuff, I have to be over here where there is no soundproofing. So maybe I'll add that someday. But then if I do, from that angle, you would see the ugly soundproofing stuff. So mine is really bad echo. That's why on my older uh, studio setup, I had that little, like, it was actually a ham radio yeah. antenna with this mic on it. So it's closer to my mouth so that the echo wouldn't come back in. So, yeah, that sounds a lot better. Uh, I think when I'm over there, it's not that bad. But even if it is, hey, I did my best to improve it, and I, I just can't improve it any more than that. No, I, I, think, think. I think it sounds all right. Well, it certainly sounds Here, all right maybe through not. my headphones. So what yeah. we're going to do today, we've got a, a few couple of stories that we're going to go through, which are interesting. The first one's really quite cool because when I looked at it this morning, I thought, wow, I'd love to talk about that with Aaron. Uh, and then we're also going to go through um, some other things like Aaron's going to show using waveforms and also histograms, which should be really interesting uh, for everyone. And then we're going to discuss uh, what type of gear we use to carry um, our stuff around with because I've got a stack of different systems that I wanted to show you uh, and Aaron's also got uh, some as well so we've got like a pretty interesting and varied show uh, that we can discuss with you today indeed so, indeed so it should be exciting so let's go through the first um, uh, story Aaron which is okay. this I found this on Petapixel this morning and it was quite interesting because it's talking about how um, photographers uh, or the news, how you can get your fake news. And this is really interesting because yeah. the way that these worked, it shows perfectly how the camera can lie. And it's using something that's that's like using big lenses and it's using compression to make the image look totally different to what you would uh, really expect it to see. And, and I'll, I'll scroll down. I'll put these links down below, though, so that you can have a look uh, and see them. 
But basically, there's a whole stack of images here that are showing how uh, with long lenses and things that you can manipulate uh, an image to look completely different. Now, for instance, this first one, I don't know whether you can see these, Aaron, or not, but um, these, these first ones here are showing, the one on the right that I'm sort of showing you here uh, is uh, showing the building that um, looks like it's way off in the distance and the people are really quite separated. So they are doing social distancing, in other words. But when they've used the lens, uh, this long lens with compression, the one on the left-hand side is the one that they actually get. Yeah, so it's, the yes, the angle and the compression is giving something that's totally different. Uh, the one underneath, if you look at the one here of the crowd, this is a really good example because it's showing the, the social distancing of the people here is actually really acceptable that they are a long way apart. But when you use the compression of the lens, it looks like they're all standing next to one another yeah. uh, in, you know, really close proximity, which is, which is amazing. And, and it's showing this all the way through um, how the one on the right there and then they look on the left and it looks like these people that are yeah. way off in the background are almost standing next to them. Um, you've got this one here, which is the people are sort of sitting way away from the background. But then when you're looking here, it looks like they're almost lying next to one another. Um, yeah. This is a really good example as well, like how far away these people are compared to when you use the compression. And again, it, it's showing it all the way through. But I thought that this is a fantastic thing to, to show that one thing, it shows what compression can do in your uh, images. And I'll talk about that in a second. I'd love Aaron's opinion about this as well. But it, it does show um, how you can uh, get things that look... Um we say oh, oh i went to the wrong camera uh, it does show how you can make things not well the well that aren't real look like they're, they're totally opposite in life now i've used this compression for uh landscape and i use this a lot where i want to say bring a mountain in close that looks if you use a wide angle lens for instance a mountain can look a long way away in a landscape shot but if you use say a 70 to 200 and you shoot it at 200 mils you can bring that mountain right back in uh, and it's yep. Compression is an amazing thing, Aaron, isn't it? Yeah, I I like compression. Um, I used to like it more than I, in the last few years, I started shooting wider lenses because I wanted to get more. I shoot predominantly portraits, so if I have a model in my scene, I I've been predominantly like to get the surrounding area, so I've been doing less and less of the longer focal lengths, but sometimes if there's something in the background that you want to bring up closer, for instance, I did a... We did a photo shoot in Paris, and we wanted the Eiffel Tower to be in the back. So if I were to use the wide lens, I forget the platform uh, that we did that on. It's a famous platform there. If you use like a really wide lens, that Eiffel Tower will just be smaller in the shot. So the longer the focal length you use, the bigger and closer that um, Eiffel Tower gets. So you got to use it right, because if it's too long, then it's going to be like too zoomed in, and you're not going to see the whole thing. And if you're using too wide, it's going to be real small in the background mm -hmm. and, and does not look too... Too pleasing. So there's a a balance and and a, something that you should know on how to use or what compression does to your scene. Because since I've been doing photography for for a while, I knew about what uh, focal length I would need to get the Eiffel Tower to be about where I hope it would be. You know, because I've been there before, so I kind of knew already. But I was thinking about compression while thinking about setting up the shot well in advance before we even got there. So compression is something you should really understand so you can get what you want. If there's something in the back and you want to bring it closer, then you'd want to use a more of a telephoto lens. Yeah, it's, and I love Mark said, uh, every journalist needs a 600 millimeter GM. <laughs> Well, yeah, if you want to get close to somebody, that's for sure. Uh, I know, it is. It's, it's interesting, but, but like it blows you away when you look at these you, you forget yeah. about it actually and you can just see how that you the image can be manipulated to look however they like um by yeah, angles they say, look, these people in yeah. this town isn't using yeah. social distancing how dare they but they yeah. were it's just that angle and the the compression was given the idea of fake news saying this certain town isn't doing what they're supposed to or whatever so yeah yeah, it's it's kind it's really in, it is interesting, and I, I thought, wow, it's um. When I went through that this morning, I thought oh, I've got to talk about that because it is interesting. And and like I said, I, I do use this now for travel photography because I'm often shooting now landscapes with longer lenses due to the fact that I, I don't know it may be it may be just me, but I find if I just shoot with a wider angle lens and you've got this amazing mountain in the background, everything flattens out and it looks really uh, more uninteresting. But when I went to New well, Zealand, for instance, I used a seventy to two hundred a lot, Aaron. 
Yeah, it's funny you say that because when I do landscape, which I hardly ever do, I kind of wanted to really get into it, but I just can't. But when I typically do landscape, I, I do the opposite of when I shoot portraits now is I do want to use a telephoto zoom lens because depending on like your scene, you know, like if you're, we're not talking about like a horseshoe bend where you're at a yeah. certain spot and it's this big. It's like you're going out in the country and you say, oh, hey, pull over, let's take this shot and you see a mountain in the distance, if you use a wide lens, it's going to be all small, and you have all this sky, unless the sky is really dramatic or something. Mm. It's going to be kind of like, eh. But then if you got a telephoto out to zoom in, use that compression to bring that mountain scene up, then you know you can get a whole different perspective on that. And typically, I use more zoom uh, when getting those type of shots than I do wide. I even tried going around to 24 mil, and I just wasn't feeling it as far as uh, uh, landscapes. And I went back to I 28 was good for me. And then when I look at my photos, actually, I'm using a little more than that. Of course, it depends on the scene. But typically, I like to zoom in a little more. The other way you could do it is if you see that mountain and you like shooting wide, you can get out of your car if you can't or drive way, you know, miles yeah. and miles to get closer to it mm. to get a wider shot to make the mountain bigger. But that's like, well, yeah, right. You know, so unless you're set out to do that. But yeah, typically I'm using compression on uh, longer lenses for landscape photography. Well, it, it's and the other thing too was interesting because I did some tests. I should show them one time, but I did some tests when I went to New Zealand and I was using the 16 to 35 uh, and I was uh, photographing Mount Cook, which is a really uh, big, it's the yeah, largest Mount in Cook. the Southern Hemisphere anyway, but but it's, it's, it's a really uh, large mountain snow capped and everything else. And I, I used a wide angle lens and then I looked at the image and I thought, Oh, it doesn't look big at all. Like it, it looks, yeah. you know, it just sort of blended in with the background then, and it wasn't no exactly. impact. So I got out the seventy to two hundred, and I shot it at two hundred mil with some foreground and the mountain in the background. Then the mountain started to fill in the frame, and it looked like mm -hmm. a completely different image due to that compression that was sort of there. You know, which was really interesting, and I learned a lot by doing that actually. Yep, I, I'm the same with you on that one. Uh, when I'm doing the portrait thing, usually we're like in small towns or something like that. Then I want to use wider than uh, what I used to use was um, probably about a, anywhere from an 85 to a 200 millimeter equivalent uh, lens on depending on what system. And to, to bring that compression, because it just looks cool, but more and more I've been using wider lenses, uh, basically more around that 50 millimeter just to get in the, the scene that I'm at. So I'm getting less compression, but for that type of shot, I, I don't need it. So, yep, you got to really understand compression in order to understand uh, what you're going to get in your final uh, photo or video. All right, cool. Let's just see if anyone uh, is sort of asking any questions about this or whatever. I, I just thought we'd say um, hi to everyone anyway. How about a thumbs up too, man? Yeah, we got yeah, uh, love some thumbs up actually. If you could give us some, uh, it does make a difference because Aaron and myself both are unsponsored, so it, it certainly does make it a helps difference. A whole bunch. Um, let's just see. A lot of people are sort of saying, "Yeah, well, you don't need to say, uh, to fake the pictures in the U.S. because no one's following the social <laughs> social <laughs> distances anyway." <laughs> uh, no need to fake it here. Just use a wide use a, uh, a wide lens to capture it all. No yeah, fake news. I love it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's funny. what Ian De Brown said. But all those pictures are in Europe. In, in the US, it would really look worse. I love it. <laughs> um, what else are we saying? The Goldilocks of focal lengths. Uh, uh, hey, Panda. Um, what they're saying um, for uh, the 600 GM. Um, what's this one uh, we're saying here? Oh, where were we? Um, see, Ike said he found a Trevor. program that works fine. But, but you can't do any fancy stuff, but it works. Uh, no headaches, just plug and play. Um, and that's what Ike's been using for his live broadcasts. Um, what does he use? Uh, I can't remember what he was using, Ike. It was a paid program, wasn't it, though, that you were using, uh, I think. Um, what else have we got? Uh, what's that one? Uh, Aaron has his PPE hanging on the wall behind him next to his logo. I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just in case, man. It's just in case if we have a really bad fallout. I actually um, did a video putting that on my face. <laughs> um, I am the Browns here, so good day. Uh, Jim's in here as well. Uh, Mark said, uh, news lives on sa uh, sensationalism. They have to have dramatic stories every day. It's a tough slot. Exactly. Um, what else? Drama said, sells, I guess. Yeah, it does, I suppose. George said, uh, after many years in the media, you learn quickly that editors don't select images that accurately depict what happened. They pick the yeah, photos that fit their notion and what should have been, uh, should have happened, I suppose. 
uh, yeah. is saying. Um, what else? John was saying there was there was a uh, there was a picture of two beach beaches side by side. Um, they say there wasn't social distancing, but you could tell the sand colour was different. The east coast is different to the sands on the uh, on the other coast. So they're saying that they used two different um, coasts that they were showing it. Oh, as well. <laughs> um, hey, it's fake news. What do you expect? Yeah, I love it. Uh, with Trev also put a thing here too, said with Nikon and Panasonic hopping on the ProRes RAW train, I noticed there was a Ninja V update for um, a RAW update the other day, and I think that was for Canon. I, I can't remember. There was another one for Ninja V. But he's saying with Nikon and Panasonic hopping on the ProRes RAW train, how can Sony not do the same? People want it. Well, we're hoping there's, there could be an announcement in June, which I'll talk about on Friday, but... There are some, but whether that's going to turn out to be just a, an RX camera, who knows? <laughs> yeah. um, that's about it, I think. Yeah. All right, After so that last Sony it. thing, you know, everybody's skeptical now. Yeah, I know. I mean, God, that was a pretty bad uh, show. <laughs> so what we're going to do now, we're going to go on to the next story, but Aaron's going to take us through uh, using uh, histograms and waveforms. Now, that, like we discussed last week, that waveforms um, particularly are incredible uh, if you, uh, uh, was it waveforms you're going to discuss, Aaron? I right uh, know we're going to talk about, last week we talked about That's waveforms right, wave and how we, how you uh, read a waveform in yep. your recorded video and David brought up oh, the right. idea. Yeah, he said, hey, um, how do you, how do you expose for that? And, and right. if you didn't watch it, watch the last uh, week because we talked about how we, how Hollywood, t most Hollywood movies takes what you have coming out of camera and then crushes it, not crushes it, but brings it way down on a waveform. So that's kind of the cinematic way of uh, uh, color grading or exposing after in, in post. So check that out. So did you want yeah. to say something else? Yes, so we were going to look at this week zebras and also the histogram. So Aaron's going to take us through parts of that today, which should be uh, interesting as long as everything works. So we're just <laughs> going to keep our fingers crossed. Should I try to share my screen now? Yep, let's go, Aaron. Let's, okay, let's see if this is going to work. Don't forget your time, too, to put down. Oh, I don't have no audio on this, so I'm just going to okay. do it this way, because I know this one works. Can you see it? Yep. Okay, so, yeah, I already put the timer there. Okay, so um, we want to show you, now this is the waveform. We are talking about waveforms, and I mentioned last week on how you can use zebras to expose uh, for photography or videography. Now, I uh, let's hope I can bring this up real quick. Um, whoopsies. Where's it at? Okay, so can you see that, David? I'm yeah. lost. What am I saying? Okay. Um, here's a video I did. Uh, it was a year ago. It's called Using Zebra for Photography on the Sony a7 III. Oh, hang on, Aaron. So if you go switch over. I'll switch. Sorry. I've got to go there. Okay, so if you go to my YouTube channel, Aaron J. Anderson, uh, scroll down about a year ago, I did a video here called Using Zebra for Photography on the Sony a7 III. This goes into much more detail than I'm going to go here live, but check that out. And basically, um, what that, uh, where's that at? What that does, uh, you could do it with any camera with Zebra. Because last week someone said, you know, how do you expose for uh, the cameras that don't have uh, waveforms? You use Zebras. Uh, most photographers don't use zebras because it's mainly thought of as a video feature. But if you're shooting RAW or JPEG in a Sony a7 III, you can use the zebra. And what zebra does is you, if you put it at 100, it's going to tell you that you're clipping your highlights. You know, you see all the zebras on the screen, so you know it's clipping. There's also a setting called 100 plus, which uh, expands that a little more. And if you shoot RAW, you can do 100 plus zebra and then just back it off till you don't see no more zebras and you're good to go. Even if there's a little bit of dancing zebras with raw on photography, raw uh, photos, you can bring that back. Uh, when it comes to just the scene, I mean, when it comes to uh, skin tones, because we were talking about this waveform right here. Um, let me play, I'm gonna show you guys how I do this. So here's a video of me just earlier before we did this. The lighting's all different because the sun was out and all that. But I want to expose for my skin tone. So how do you do that using zebra? If you put your zebra, let's see if this is going to switch. I don't know why everything's so slow over here. Look, this is, there we go. Let's, 
Let's see if I can make this bigger. If you put your camera on Zebra and you put it at 75%, what you want to do is look at your actor's face. And what you want to do is you want to just uh, either bring in more light or less light or expose your camera to where you just have a little bit of Zebra dancing on someone's face like you can see here. I'm going to play this back. And you can see that there's a little bit of Zebra on my face here. That is at 75%. And if you let zebras ride on your face just a little bit and you want to be safe, you can just bring it off a little bit like I did here. This was at 500 ISO. So by bringing it down to 400 ISO, now you can see there's no zebra on my face. And what that gives you is, let's go back to the 500. This is the shot. Uh, my skin is not blown out at all at, at zebra at 75% and having just a little bit of zebra dancing around. But if you want to be safe and you just uh, set the exposure to where the zebras just uh, disappeared from someone's face, you're going to get, of course, a little bit lower exposure like this here. Nothing's blown out. And what that does for you by using this technique with the camera with zebras and not waveform, if we bring up the waveform, what you want to always do is expose skin tones around 640, as you can see right here. And if you look, if you guys didn't watch last episode, uh, if I play this, you're going to see my face moving here. See it right here? That's my face moving. And that's letting you know where the exposure is on my face. And we're right, I mean, almost dead center at 640. Now, it depends on your skin tone. If you're darker complected or, or lighter complected, it's going to bounce around a little bit. But you're definitely using 75% zebras are typically going to be right dead on in your waveform where you want skin tones. If we go to the 500 and we play this back, my computer's having issues for some reason. We can see now we're above 640. We're still good, but we're getting closer to, to the top end where you kind of want to stay from. So use zebras at 75% for skin tones, and you're gonna do almost, I mean, look at that. That's like almost exactly 640 every time. So when I expose for these live, or any of my YouTube uh, videos, I, 75% zebras, and I go until I don't see any zebras. Now, I've done this, and the lighting's always the same, so I already know my settings. I don't have to do it every time. So that's how you expose for skin tone, 75%. Now, um, if you want to expose a scene uh, in photography, if you're a photographer and you've never used zebras because you think it's a video feature, this is just a shot I did. Actually, I did a video of this as well. I don't think I had that queued up. Uh, let me see. I'm just going to check if I have it. I have it somewhere, or maybe on this one or that one. No, I don't have it queued up. But anyways, I did a video also uh, showing how to expose using. Oh, I just showed you guys that before I started. It's the same video. Hello. But if you see here, I <laughs> just as like I already showed you guys. This right here is the back of the camera because I did it live while I was doing a photo shoot. And I don't know if you guys can see it, but this is a live shot doing photography. My wife is down here. And if you put it at zebra and you're shooting raw and you put it at 100%, this is, could be video or photography, but if you're doing photography and you're shooting raw, you can set zebras to 100%. And this is how I expose all my photography. You can see zebras up here in the sky. Now, if there was some clouds up there, I wouldn't want to blow that out. So I would adjust my settings to where there's no more zebras here. And then I would just add flash to the scene here to light uh, the model up. And that's how you can get beautiful skies. And it's so quick to expose this way to keep zebras at 100%. If you're shooting raw, point it at a scene, even if you're doing landscape, and you just see zebras like, ooh, that's a beautiful sky. I don't want to blow out those clouds. So then you uh, adjust your settings to where you don't see any more zebra. And just go right below to where there's no zebra. Now, sometimes you don't, sometimes there's stuff you don't care to blow out. Like if there was no real clouds in this shot and it was just completely overcast, then there's no reason for me to even worry about the, the zebras. Then I would just expose uh, the shot however I would want if I'm not using flash or how dark I want the background, stuff like that. So that's in a quick nutshell how you do it. Now, if you're shooting JPEG, then definitely put it on a uh, hundred zebra on a hundred because a hundred plus you're getting pretty close to uh, clipping there. And if we bring back this, I forgot to go into this. We can look at uh, the what do you call it? The histogram over here on the right because David also asked uh, or someone mentioned about exposing to the right and all that. When you're exposing, 
using zebras, you are basically exposing as far as you can to the right, lifting those shadows as much as possible before your camera sensor clips. So it's a really good way to basically expose to the right by just using zebra because whatever's in the scene, if you don't want that to clip, you just go up to a zebra and you back it off and that's as much as much as you can expose to the right without something important being blown out, like let's say a bride's dress. If you see zebras on it, you don't want that, just back it off till there's no more zebras. And if you're not using any more light, I mean, that's all you can basically do is don't blow out the dress, don't see no zebras, you're good to go. And to illustrate that, if we show you the shot that I used at 500 ISO right here, you can see the histogram is pretty close to perfect. Of course, we have some blown out there, but that's this light that's insignificant to the shot because there's no way I can expose for that and me at the same time, unless I put a dimmer on the light and all this stuff. But you can see right here in the middle, we're pretty well exposed. If we go to that one where I went down to 400 ISO right here, you can see I'm basically underexposing now, but you just got to make a call. That's where the skin tones don't have any zebras. So if this is all the light you have, you could put a little more zebra on the face, 75% and you know you're brightening up the scene as much as possible. So, you know, you gotta kinda learn this and kinda play it by ear. But this is so close that in post, even with an 8-bit codec and uh, and all that stuff, you can bring this back into post very easy because it's not far from each other. So that's, in a nutshell, how quick you can go. One more thing, I wanted to show you something that a lot of people don't know. When you expose on almost any DSLR or mirrorless camera that I've had, if, let me put this over here, if you look at your light meter, now a lot of people know that the camera wants to make things gray. So if you go based on this light meter, as we can see here, we're at 400 ISO, and let's say I'm just staring at my light meter and I want it to be perfect, this is, you know, a little going to throw you off a little bit uh, on a lot of different shots, whether it's video or photography, because this wants to make, uh, you know, white gray. So this is basically underexposed if you want to go with the analogy of exposing to the right, of course. Um, almost every shot I do, whether it's video or photography, I always at least make this meter, say, a third of a stop over like I did here on the 500 ISO. That's a third of a stop over, and this is almost... Uh, at least for me, uh, the skin tones are almost pretty pretty good if my, if my face filled the scene, of course. But just know that if you're wondering why your camera is always kind of dark and you're always lifting it like all the time, then that's probably because you're maybe, you know, wanting your meter to show zero when it's an actual o underexposure. Because if we look at the, let's just go back, well, let's make this one bigger. So we can see it, uh, where are we at, histogram. So you can see on this shot, we're way underexposed here at 400 ISO if we go, which gives us a reading of you know z uh, zero under over. But if we overexpose by 30, but well, that's not even showing you much. Anyways, I think it's just too big. Uh, anyways, I hope you get the idea. I was hoping this would go more to the right. It did, did that this? No, this is the one, sorry. <laughs> Give me a second. Let's go bigger on this one. Here we go. Okay, so here we are at, uh, I had to go over here to see what the setting was. So that's a third of a stop over. This shot here, we can see that we're more to the right, where if we go to the ISO 4, if, uh, what was that one? That's a third of a stop. Is that right? Am I screwing up something? I think I, I, think I screwed something up here. But you get what I'm saying, I hope. Look at this meter and go a third of a stop over if you're sick and tired of always boosting your photos or video in post. But having zebras on will give you an indication. It's like, oh, I can't do that. I have to go down. So hopefully that makes any sense to any of y'all. <laughs> I'm done. No, it did. That, that was very interesting, actually. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the, the thing, too, that I always find, I use, say, for instance, when I'm shooting with log, I use something called Leeming LUT, uh, which... I've purchased oh, yeah. and yeah, um, yeah. I'll use those. Don't forget to switch back to off your desktop, Aaron. Um, yeah, I'm trying to figure out they, how. I use Leeming Light. Now, they tell you in that 
a, a certain setting that they give you with your your zebras or zebras uh, to put in. And I think on the le leaming light, it's actually reasonably low. It's actually something like, no, it might be high. It might be 100 plus, I think. You have to go a little bit over because they want you to uh, expose to the ride a little bit. Anyway, that all works out because when you load the log, that LUT in that they give you, it corrects for all of that and the image comes back again. So there's different things, diff different um, exposure settings for say like log and, and HDR and all these other settings will have different settings that you use for um, if you want to just get a balanced type um, shot using those um, zebras. But like Aaron was saying there, this is talking about getting it for your skin. So if you had a yeah. ride that was sitting on, you would set those zebras to that 75% that Aaron was talking about. And, as, and then as soon as those zebras go away from the face, then you know that that's a perfect exposure for your bride. Now the background may go, yes. And, and this is the judgment that Aaron was talking about, that yeah. you have to make a judgment of what you want to have in, you know, be exposed. And that's why I love waveform so much, because you can see exactly the the part that you're looking at in the waveform and you can't make a mistake in that regard and that's why I think the waveforms have an advantage uh, over everything but unfortunately you know we haven't got those in in yeah. the Sony cameras for instance uh, but that was great Aaron I mean it was really interesting uh, to show that I use um, for instance I, I set Kerry's camera up because Kerry is an amazing uh, has an amazing photographic eye but she um, has a uh, no idea about the camera settings at all. Absolutely no right. idea. So I set them for her. But what I do is I put her in aperture exposure uh, for her and then I set the zebras at 100% and I tell her to make sure that whatever she has that interest in particularly, um, she will never blow out and then I can always recover or what I need to do. But she uses those zebras to make sure she doesn't, say, overexpose a bride's dress or, or it's something really easy. like that. Yeah, and, and that works. So she does it just so the zebras... Uh, just disappear and then uh, we know that it's set um, you know about right but like I said I think Leaming Lut was 100 plus uh, that had to be set for that because you had to expose a little bit um, to the right but uh, you know it's it's very interesting there's so much involved in these Aaron isn't there to get exposures correct yeah there is you know like when uh, we I've been doing it so long I don't really think about it but um, yeah, there's a like we talked about the compression. Like when you're doing a photograph, there's a lot of stuff going on in a photographer's mind, and I think that's why some people get a little, uh, you know, frustrated when they first start. It just it takes time, and you go, oh, that's now I get it. So if you're new to photography or videography, the best thing to do is just you know take what you hear from us and other channels and books or whatever you read, and just go out and just start shooting all the time. Then you're gonna wonder because I remember when I first started. Um, I had a discussion with somebody. We were shooting like a flower or something in, in front. It, it was in a kitchen. It was like a flower or something. And we were just talking about cameras. And we had the cameras in our hand. And they were saying, oh, you know, why Why is it dark? And this was when I was just, just getting into it. And we didn't know. We were like, why is the flower dark and the background's bright? And we're trying to fiddle around with all the settings. So it can be frustrating. But once you start uh, fiddling around with your camera and go, oh, okay, that made the background brighter and this is brighter and that one's darker. And then you just start doing it. So just practice all the time with a lot of a lot of different scenarios and you'll get it and it'll become uh, really easy. And I would suggest you use Zebra because if there's something with Zebra on it and that's important to you, then make exposed to you don't see any Zebra. It's like pretty, pretty yeah. easy. Now, remember too that the, the Sony cameras do have a, a I think you can get get about a, a stop back on the highlights. So they used to say you couldn't have any recoverage at all, um, or it might be half a stop, I can't remember. But but I know there's definitely an area where uh, not long ago, if you went over in the exposure on the highlights, they were gone. But now there is a decent amount of recovery that you can get from the highlights. So you've got to maintain that as well. It's like I've said to you, exposure is critical in the fact of do not underexpose. And I keep saying this all the time, that you have to use that full range that the sensor can give you. And the only way you can get that is to not underexposed particularly if you want to keep noise down uh, you know exactly. and that's why yeah I'm always using things like the the um, histogram uh, I also use quite a lot you know your exposure meter down the bottom that shows you what your exposure is as well Aaron I, I use that a lot to get uh, yeah, to work because out what exposure is these tools like the zebras and histogram are allowing you to push it as far as it can go bringing up all those shadows where you need to be and I, I didn't go into this, which was a question last week, but by exposing with zebras right to the break of, you know, blown out highlights, you still have all that information then 
bringing that down in post-production is only allowing you to make those shadows as dark as you want. So if you're shooting something and there's a rabbit underneath an apple tree mm -hmm. in the shade, you can see it because you exposed right before you clipped out the, the, the sky, let's say. But in post, if it's like, oh, the rabbit's it, it's in the corner of the frame, it's blurry, I don't need to see it, then you can crush it and not see it. I mean, it's now it's your uh, decision to do that. And anyways, by bringing those down instead of raising them in post, by bringing them down, you're just hiding the, sh uh, the, the noise more, the noise that's already there if you underexpose. Because I know we talked about this, David, and people ask you, how do you get those clean shots? We just said it. If you underexpose and you have to bring it up in post, you're going to see all that noise. So just yeah. always exp overexpose, not overexpose, but use you can, zebras you and can expose a little bit, the point. Yeah. You can actually go a little bit over. Uh, yeah, and 100 bring it plus. Back. Yep, yep. Actually, 100 plus with Sony a7 III RAW, if I have, like, if I'm shooting something and there's a sky and there's clouds and there's a there's kind of some bright spots in the clouds, it's pretty dramatic. Even sometimes when I saw some uh, zebras dancing, I, I took the chance to blow out that little bit of highlights because the majority of everything's better, and I was still able to bring back yeah. those even at 100 plus. So 100 plus with RAW on the Sony cameras is a good place to just dance around a little bit of zebras if it's kind of uh, not so important to you, but you'll probably be able to bring those back. Yeah, like Yipper. I said, there's more recovery than what you think. I mean, it's not as much yeah. as the shadows, but there's more recovery in the highlights that you can bring things down. If, yeah. if you're shooting JPEG, forget it. You use yeah. 100, oh, yeah. zebra 100, and don't see any zebra. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, you've, you just haven't got that control once you do that. Exactly. So. All right, so we're going to keep going because we're going to talk about um, what we wear with uh, belts and stuff and, and camera uh, gear. Now, Aaron, did because the, cause I've got three setups. Oops, I've got three setups that I use um, that I'm going to show uh, that I use depending on whether I'm I'm just going out and doing a normal shoot, uh, a wedding, or, or something like that. So I've got three different systems that I'm going to show. But Aaron's going to talk about his systems that he uses, which is the Peak Design stuff. Um, so if you want to go on about those, Aaron. All righty. Let's, uh, oh my gosh, this live stuff is all these things. Let me, let me just show you real quick, because if you guys are interested in a hand strap, I stopped using um, neck straps like a long time ago, and I would just hold the camera. I've seen some uh, guys on YouTube uh, just hold the camera with nothing as well. and. Me and my wife, it was like I it do was that two often, years. Aaron. <laughs> Say what? I oh, do that. Yeah, often. well, I shouldn't. Yeah. Wait, I I would always do that because I just can't stand a strap, and you know, having a strap on, of course, is is limiting. And I love getting down on low shots and all the stuff. So I'd have to take the thing off, and then when I'm taking it off, the thing's hanging. I'm just, I mean, I got so frustrated, like I'm always fighting with this thing. So I just took it off and forgot about it. And Peak Design does have some quick snaps, but it's still, I don't want to be snapping stuff off and on, just forget it. So I got rid of all the straps and we were on a uh, cruise ship uh, two years ago. We were pulling into Russia and there's this beautiful um, shot and I didn't have any straps or nothing. And I was holding the camera and on a cruise ship or any balcony basically with other rooms next to you, there's like a divider. And I was looking through there and as I was, you know, trying to, I had my elbows on the, uh, the railing and as i was trying to get the shot i bumped into the divider that divides the rooms and i i i, I fumbled my camera and almost had a heart attack because i mean that would have just it would have been gone so since that minute i was like i have to have something so i started researching what's the best way because i know you can get these um these wrist straps that connect to the camera i tried that but man if I want to get rid of this camera and put it down and pick up an ice cream cone or a Coke or something, I would have to snap it off or pull my hand out. And I, that's another thing. I just want to pick it up and go and put it down whenever I want. A lot of times, too, when I'm setting up a scene, whether it, uh, if I'm using flashes for a photo shoot, uh, a lot of times I would put the camera down on the ground and fix the flash and all that. So having a strap or having this on me is just like, it's just a no-go for me. So I was looking into stuff and real quick, I'm just gonna show you, I did a video on this product I'm about to talk uh, here. It's called the, uh, you can see it right here. Yep. It's a Peak Design strap right there. And if you wanna head on over to my channel, you can see the full review on that. And what that is, it leaves, uh, it holds its position out like this. So when it's just sitting on there, it's holding a position. If you want to pick it up, you just slip your hand in there. Now it's on there secure. And the way it hangs, you can watch my video. 
the way it hangs off of your hands on the grip and that, it really can't come out of your hand unless you, you know, want it to come out by making your hand flat and trying to make, but it, your natural grip, it just, it just stays right there. Did you have and another when I wanna, still in that video, Aaron, that you could show oh, it uh, better? No, I haven't. Uh, you know what? I was going to do that. Haven't. I was going to do it. Um, I'm going to just doesn't matter go if you through. haven't. Just show a little bit more footage with you walking with it, just so people can see. Okay, uh, let's just what that see. Is. And it would yeah, bring me to another point perfect, on how yeah. I, how I get it off of my belt if I have it on there using the capture clip, which I'll see. See how it's right on there? I pulled it right off my belt, and yep, that was perfect. See, yep, it's just like. It is, yep. Watch that video. I explain everything I'm about to hear, but I'll just go through it real quick. So that is what I started going. So now. I could put it in a bag, I can clip it on my belt, I could do anything with it. If I wanna do a flash or fix a dress or something during a wedding, I can just put it, my camera down and nothing to fiddle with. So that's replaced my neck straps. Now the next thing that I started using is the Peak Design uh, capture clips, I think that's what they're called, which yep. can go on your belt like you saw in the video. So if I don't wanna hold it no more, before you'd have that thing hanging around your neck, which is a no-go for me. Now I can just click it on my belt and then it would just be there like that. Or you could put it on a strap on a backpack and put it there like that. And so that was another, that's another thing that I would use. And, but there was a little bit of an issue with this. And that is when you have it on your belt, it's very, um, the, the camera just sticks straight out, boom. And the lens, depending on how you put it in there, just sticks straight down and there's like no give to it. It's just thing that just like sticks out. So before I started using those, I was using the spider uh, things, which I think David might use these too. Yes, I'm gonna um, show those actually, Aaron. Yeah, I won't go into this, I'll let him go into it, but I started using these. And at the time, this was for my Nikon D750, which was a bigger camera. But with this, I had to then, put a tripod plate on the bottom of this to put it on a tripod, which made this thing big and heavy, especially on smaller cameras. So then they came out with uh, a smaller one. I've had these for a long time and use them for uh, many years now. And this is a very low profile one compared to this bigger one for mirrorless cameras. You can see the size difference and it has an Arca Swiss built in. So I don't need to then put on a tripod plate. So now I with this I'll on have the- I get those myself. Oh yeah, and because I use Arca Swiss like David does on everything. So now this is a very low profile that sits on the bottom of the camera. And the difference from this and one of these is when you have that on your belt, the camera just sticks straight out, boom, like that. With these, it, it, it hangs down, it's so, so it hangs down your leg. And I could literally use this, like when I go to New York and I have my strap, I put this thing into the holster which that's this part that goes on your belt. Yep. It's very, very secure. That goes on your belt. And it can go on any pant pocket. You can take it off if you're not using it, put it on. And this goes in like that. And because it hangs, it hangs right against your body, unlike the capture clips that are just straight out, which is very annoying. So with this system, even if you have a longer lens, uh, 70 to 200 or whatever you have, when you sit down, even like if we're at New York and we go to dinner, when I sit down, this thing just, drapes on my body and the lens you can just put on your inner uh, leg and you can sit there and eat and it's just it's not out of the way you don't have to put it on the table you don't have to put it back in a bag i mean it's a really really simple way to go so that's how i've been rolling for a long time and then with that strap that i just showed you it's on the camera i'm pointing to it i could just pull it off and i'm not fear of dropping it and real quick before david goes one of the uh, a lot of the ways how i've been carrying my cameras is basically in a peak design bag. I've got a five liter and then the 10 liter. And these are so easily, you know, you could swing around in front of you like this and I could just put the camera in here and zip it up. You know, it takes a little more time, of course, but if I'm walking, like we're not, we're walking like blocks in say New York, I'll have it in there, have this, you know, wrapped around on my back there. When I get there, I can take it out and then I can start using the, uh, you know, the spider on that just for like, hey, let's go over there and I don't want to hold it or I want to hold an ice cream or a bag, I do that. So that's kind of how I do things. And one more uh, little thing is um, if you're using a peak design thing on a, a, a backpack, this is probably better than this because the spider can just kind of, you know, it's going to flop around on you and you don't want that. So this isn't good for that and it's not good for putting on your bag. So I have a 
peak design on here because when the camera goes on, it's sturdy there, it works better. If I use this thing, it would just be flopping around and that wouldn't work. If you use it here, it wouldn't work. So peak design is good for certain situations, but when it's on your waist, I think this is better. But talking about peak design real quick, I don't know if you guys ever seen this, but this is by Peak Design and it's a lens holder. These are just caps that I actually don't use when I'm using this. Something like this is good for a wedding where, yeah, for, for weddings I like it. Because let me show you how I used it. I've had this for years too. I don't use it all that often, but let me show you how uh, you can use this. Using the same Peak Design clip, when this goes on here, you put it on your waist. Now, if you don't want it like this, you can pull this and then go like that so you can have take the lens off that way or take the lens off that way, either way. And how I usually roll when it's a smaller wedding and I'm only using like two lenses and one camera, I'll put the 24 on here and I'll have, let's say the 50 or 85-ish uh, on the camera, whichever, depending on where we're shooting. And then it's just easy lens swaps because uh, you take it off the camera, you put it on here and you take the other one off and on the camera, it's very quick. How I used to do it would just be, uh, having the lens in the bag, I don't know if you could see this, I'd have a lens in the bag, I would do, but during a wedding uh, ceremony, I would have this, you know, around my back, which was fine, but then I have to swing it forward, I'd have to unzip it, I'd have to grab the lens, put the lens, put it back, and I would have to zip it back up, because uh, heaven forbid, if I didn't zip it back up and swung that around and all my stuff would fall out, it would be terrible. So I then would use something like this if it's just a two lens type swap because now it's just boom, boom, and I don't have that thing swinging around and I like to get on the ground and the bag swings this side. So that's what I use, David. What do you use? <laughs> Sorry for talking so fast. Well, there was a lot to get through. Um, let me just take these out. So I'm gonna turn on the light because I'll show a, a few different systems that I use. Now I have to, most of the time what I do, I do tend to be just shooting, and this this is what I've got to change because I probably should get those hand straps that you've got, but oh, I'm, I'm tending to just use the camera naked as it is. And it's what I've always oh, done. God. And I'd use that all the time and I, I've never dropped them. So I mean, I, I suppose all the time I've been good in that regard. Um, that that's never happened. The only time I've ever dropped something is if it's come off my strap actually where I haven't tightened it up enough. Um, so I've never had that, but when I was in the US and I was using Michael's A7R4, that had that hand strap built onto it and I loved it. Uh, it felt safe, I never had to worry about it. I could just let my hand down and it wouldn't fall off. So I, yeah, I do understand what you're saying, Aaron. But let me show you what I use. Um, so I'll just switch mics, so I'll have to go to this, this other one so you can hear me when I go back a bit. Okay, so hopefully uh, the audio will show through. Um, let me turn this light on. All right, so the first one that I'll show you is, uh, now I'm gonna get a bit of echo, guys. There's not much I can do about it, but this one is a rapid, it's a black rapid strap. Um, and I quite like this because it has a little pocket in the top that you can, it was originally meant for an iPhone, but now the phones are too big to fit in there. Um, but you can just uh, stick, say, a spare battery in there or something like that. And it also has a zip pocket in the side that you can also stick things in uh, as well. Like you can put extra cards or lens cleaning cloths or, or, your, or your pens. But this just goes over the side like this. Now there's two ways you can wear it. You can be on this side or it can be on your other side. I tend to like it more on this side. Uh, and I'll stick a camera on so you can see how it works. Now these just have these normal, um, they're like a screw system with a rubber grommet on the end, and they just screw in. They're not hard to get in. So you just screw them in like that, and then that will just sit down the side like this. Now it's quite comfortable because of this big sort of strap that you have over the side here. And the beauty of these is they just sort of sling up, so they will just sling up when you want to use them. So that's one that I use if I want to sort of travel uh, minimal in the way that I go. And it's very, like I said, very, very comfortable. I'll just move this so you can see it. Uh, it's very comfortable to use. Um, and I, I often go that way. Now that's one system that I use. But what about if I want to say carry two uh, cameras if I'm doing something where I'm not going all day and I don't want to take the weight uh, onto my hips. Well, I'll show you a different system that I've got. So I'll just undo this one.
So this is the next one that I use. Now this is also, this is a Black Rapid, you can see the R there. This is a dual system, so if I put this on, Uh, then they will button sort of up at the top, so this sort of tries oh, cool. to take the weight away from here. And then again, all you do is you will screw this into the system through here. This is the one that I actually dropped because I didn't do it in enough. I learned after yeah. doing that, that you because it's got this rubber grommet that you'll sort of see here, you have to tighten that up so it goes quite tight. In, I didn't do it enough, and that's when I dropped a camera and I actually uh, broke a D810 and a 7200. Um, oh my the gosh. The broke all in here. But it, it, that will take two cameras, so I can have one on this side and I can have one on that side. So that works pretty well, and again, um, you know, you can bring that up quite easily, let that drop, and then you can bring your other one up as well. Um, and so that's quite a good system, and it has that. You know, a, a little bit of a, a cross at the back, so it takes away the weight. But if you're carrying around big cameras, this can get quite heavy at the end of the day. So this isn't what I wear to weddings. When I go to weddings, I'll show you the system that I wear in weddings, and it's combined two systems together. Because I noticed um, uh, Jim was saying that he can't wear a belt system because he's got no bum and it just falls down to the ground. So I'll show you what I use for that, because I've, I've worked out a system that helps me with that. Let me take this off. So this is the next system. Now, now this is the system that Aaron was talking about, which is using uh, the clip that you'll see through here, which is your uh, the, the clip that Aaron mentioned um, there, which is a, a spider holster, I think it is. Um, but yeah. At the top holster. of this, I've also put a think tank uh, ex extra, which is a way to hold the belt up. Now this is the secret for me because like I said I haven't got much of a bum either and it just falls off if I use the belt and it's really awkward if you just use the belt, uh, this um, spider holster. So I'll show you how it works. Um, it's got this nice webbing at the back so I just put this around. Always awkward to get on. <laughs> I'll have to take it off. Hang on. Take your time there, I buddy. Get Kerry to help me put this on, to be honest. Here we go. <laughs> Let me do that. Okay. So this here has your two bits here. It will join at the side as well. There's a clip there. Also, that Peak Design clip I've got here, if I want oh, to stick yeah. onto that side of it. And the belt just buckles in. Now, the beauty Buckle here up. is that... I can then grab any camera and just put that into the belt on both sides. Now, the, the issue is that before, this would just fall off because I haven't got enough of a waist and a bum to hold it up. So this takes, because I've now got this up the top, this takes all of the weight from that falling off. So it won't fall down, but the weight is still held by the uh, waist. So this is a system sort of built up from two, and I can walk around all day like this without any uh, back pain or anything else because I don't have to worry about it slipping off because that stops it, but the waist takes the uh, weight. And I've also got a big yeah, pack cool. at the back, which I stick a water bottle in. Um, you can also put other things on too through this um, system as well. But this is two great systems put together. This is a think tank Very system cool. up the top. Uh, I've got the peak design here that I can just stick like a small camera in or something like that. Uh, and I can have a water bottle and everything else put through this system. So this is my wedding system uh, that I use. Uh, and I really do uh, love this for weddings. So let me just put this down and I'll come back to the shack. Okay, 
So that's what I like to use. So there's three different systems there. Like, like I said, I may that invest. That is cool. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the problem was with the belt one, like I said, it just falls off, Aaron, and I'd be walking and I'd be constantly trying to push it up all the time because it just wouldn't sit. Particularly if you have a decent lens on there, like a, a 70 to 200 or something like that, the weight would end up just pulling it down and it's really uncomfortable. So having the shoulder strap part over yeah, that's stops good. that and it made uh, it made a 100% difference. It, it was amazing. Let me that's really that. good. What yeah. a difference from my, my setup. I got just that little thing on my belt. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I might, like I said, I may go for the, um, that, that's, No, that strap, man. Yeah, but the strap's great, it, but I might put that other, uh, smaller, uh, uh, spider holster one on, you know, that smaller one that you showed. Oh, uh, this one, yeah, the low I might profile change, with the arc I might change twist to that. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's a no brainer. It's the same thing as this, uh, but it has an arc of Swiss and it's smaller, you know, so. Yeah, I might do that because it'll fit better exactly. with the camera. And I'm the same as you. I'm always having to stick another, uh, the Arca Swiss mount on it, which is a pain. So I might go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I might Just go like that, that way. Just like that. Boom, 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 boom. Yep. All right. So we'll come back to Q&A uh, at the end, guys, because uh, Aaron's now going to show his, like I say, we show an image or a video. So Aaron's going to share a video today that he's done, um, which will be great. If you're not ready, Aaron, I can show my image or you're, you're okay to go. Uh, show yours. Okay. All right, so I'll bring mine up. Uh, let me just find where it was. It was actually here. I was just going to show it from this, actually. Um, let me go there. All right, I was going to show this image uh, that I captured and just talk about um, how I did this. Let me just see if I can draw on the screen. I should be able to. Um, this scribble. All right. Okay, so this is an image I took. I, I did two versions of this, actually. I did a color one, and this was a black and white one uh, that I did. Um, and I wanted to talk about how I did this and, and how it was captured because it was a little bit unusual because it was a real rainy day. But I wanted oh, to yeah. capture the movement that... Oh, now I need to change the color. Um, that is so cool. How do we do this in this thing? Let me just see if I can bring this back. Scribble preferences. I think it's in here. Oh, no, I can't. I'll have to just do it this way. I see All your right. pen. Yeah, you can see it. All right, so I wanted to show the movement in the tram. I was going to try and change the color. I have to work out how to do it oh. again. Um, but I wanted to do that movement. So the only way I could do that was to have a very slow shutter speed. Um, so what I wanted to do there was I had to have the camera on a tripod and then use a, a, a very slow shutter. I think it was about... Um, I think it was something like a sixth of a second or something. It was pretty slow anyway, but due to the fact that uh, it was so slow, I had to ask Grace to not move at all. So she couldn't move. She had to st uh, keep a still pose. Now, the flash helped because there was a flash just off the camera, which was sitting um, sort of uh, over here a little bit, and it, you know, it was just on a, a light stand, and it was just pointing the flash towards Grace to light her up from the front. But that wasn't the secret to this. That that was the secret to freezing Grace and let that movement still happen. But I also had a flash um, behind the uh, umbrella, which was pointing up. Uh, as well as one pointing down. That's how it was getting the light that was coming from the back. If you notice on the dress, she's lit up sort of from the back and it's lit up through that shoulder area up through there. And that's because there was two little speed lights uh, in this. One was pointing up to give that light that was around the umbrella there and another one pointed down to give some backlighting coming through uh, from the other side. If I didn't do that, you wouldn't have seen Grace's hair in there. It would have all been a big dark... Um, well, blob, basically, there would have been no separation, and I wanted to give that separation, so there was two flashes involved. So there was three flashes here. One was pointing down to light up from behind, and one was pointing up just into the umbrella to light up the hair area uh, from behind there uh, as well. And I love this photo. I love the, the pose that she's got. She's got those Super. beautiful angles. Um, you know, she's sort of standing on her toes on the back of the heel through there, which I love. Um, nice shape, yeah, in the, in the curve. And also the, the movement that you're getting from the tram and the reflections because it's wet. I love shooting in the rain. Um, so that's what I did with that one. That's all I wanted to show, explaining how I did it. Uh, slow shutter speed on a tripod. Your camera has to be on a tripod. Uh, the model has to stay perfectly still or as still as possible. The flash will freeze the model, but if there is some movement there, you would still see it. So you've got to hopefully uh, get the model to keep as still as possible. And then you get the movement with the tram in the background, which adds that sort of dynamic uh, bit to it. So yeah, that's, that's really all I 
wanted to show on that one. So we'll go That's back amazing to- amazing shot. I was gonna say like, there's so many elements in this one photo that makes it amazing. The pose is outstanding. Uh, she's dressed outstanding. Uh, you got the water, which just brings that whole element. Then you've got the, the mind bending uh, blur behind her when she's not. Uh, beautiful composition. It's like everything's happening there. Very good. Yeah, all right. So we'll switch over to Aaron, and Aaron will show us his uh, video. So uh, just real quick, to so you guys don't see, like, what's going on here. This is a video that I was – this was done a few years ago. I was hired by a uh, production – small production company just getting started to color grade one of their um, short films – uh, they didn't contact me before they were already done filming it and then contact me and i'll show some pointers hopefully you guys can learn uh what they did wrong there's two things you can there's two things there's color grading and color uh color grading and what's the other one color correction color correction is terrible because what you're doing is you're basically correcting things that aren't right and it's a pain in the butt. There's just all kind of stuff you got to do and try to get things right. Not just as far as uh, colors, but as uh, exposures and all this stuff. That's terrible. Color grading is actually fun, at least for me it is, because if someone films something right and it's 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 just a, it's like, wow, that's just amazing, then all you can do is just start coloring and putting uh, the vibe that the director wants to the scene. If it's a sad scene or an exciting scene or whatever, that's fun. But I'm going to show you a little bit in this uh thing what happened where I was doing a lot of color correction and also um, I'll play it and then we'll go from there I'm going to try to share this again David so let's with with audio so uh, okay can you see the black screen we did this before we started today and it worked We tried it through Skype, it worked, but last time it didn't, and we did it through OBS, it didn't. <laughs> oh, you see it? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna play it, and then I'll talk about it after. Oh, you're kidding me. Should I? Yeah, exactly the same way. Okay, so I'm stopped sharing. It's only Should showing I... you. It's not showing your... Now, well, now this is through OBS. Probably no audio. <laughs> oh, well, let's just do it like this. Uh, it's just like music in the background anyways, nothing too special. So let me just do this. So this is the short film that I did, uh, color graded for, and let me play it. It's fine. It's just music. Yeah, but there's a there's a trick behind something here. It's almost over.
Okay, so can they hear me? Okay, so what this is uh, showing you guys is I, I had to go on a trip like a week or so before I color graded this. They didn't contact me till it was all done, they needed it. So I had to rush through this. And what you do when you start color grading stuff is once your eyes, you, your eyes start getting really used to what you're seeing, it starts getting bored of what you're looking at, and you end up pushing it too much. And uh, what we're looking at here on the right is um, the, the footage untouched, you know, right out of camera. What we're looking on the left was my first grade. And I spent, you know, all night grading this stuff. And the more you, if you don't leave your computer, you just start adding more saturation and all this stuff. It wasn't until you, you know, put it away, go away for a couple hours or the next day when you come back, because what happened when I come back is like, whoa, that's just way too murky and saturated. So I'm going to play this forward. And that's what you're seeing now on the left is my first color grade, which is way too saturated and contrasty. Now this next swipe is the final version, which they liked more uh, because look, it's a little more subtle and uh, we'll stop right there. So this was a little more toned down. I took a little bit of the saturation out and I, you know, took the, uh, the, the darks up a little bit, uh, the shadows up. So it wasn't so crushed. Now this is a crappy, uh, quality just because I actually did this little test I'm showing you guys on an H264 file. So it looks kind of crappy. So if you're ever color grading, do your color grade, uh, you know, let it sit for a day, come back and then look at it and then go back to it. Cause you might say, whoa, I added way too much sharpening or I added way too much contrast or saturation. Yeah. Which I did. And then I went back and fixed it and they liked, they like, oh yeah, that looks so much better. Cause I showed them which one do you like better? And they said, oh, this, this second version, uh, they liked better. So keep that in note. And also when it comes to actual filming something, if they would have like, you know, if they would have you know talked to me, uh, first, and they were going to tell me that because they were new to, to filmmaking. This shot here is way beyond the scope of the codec that they were using. In order for me to keep this background, man, there's just nothing I could have done in post to bring enough um, to bring these characters up. Because we were just talking about skin tone and how to expose for them. Well, this is like way, way down. I mean, this wouldn't even register on the on the waveform monitor because it's just way underexposed for skin tone. So if we, can I scroll through this? So if we scroll through this, this was my first take on it, which was a little oversaturated. And let's just go to the second one. And here is a little more toned down. Now you can see all the information that was lost in the background because they didn't use any lighting to light up the scene. So as a colorist, I'm like, man, what am I gonna do here? I could either leave them dark and way underexposed or bring it up and blow out the background. So I did two versions, let them, hey, which one do you want? Use whatever one you want. And they use this one because naturally you can see the actors way better than when it's um, underexposed. So what I told, what they could have done in this scene is super, super cheap and super easy. Um, I can come back out to me now. Let's, uh, let's undo that one. I can actually put this over here, I think. Can you guys see that behind me? What they could have done is so simple. They could have went to Home Depot and for about $25 buy a, uh, a workshop light that's on a little tripod and has those lights. It's like 300 watts or something like that. And all they had to do is like, here's the camera filming the scene. All they had to do is put that cheap $25 work light on whatever side of the room and just shine it off the room and up on top of the ceiling and all that light would have came in and lit up this whole scene, which would be closer to balancing out that uh, the background. So as a colorist, or in this case, a color corrector, um, we could have kept the detail in the background by just lighting the scene very cheap. Now, if the walls were painted a certain color, then all you'd have to do is probably go in the other room of this house that they filmed in and pulled off a white sheet and duct taped it or had someone hold it and shine that cheap $25, 300 watt Home Depot light off of the sheet and would have bounced all this beautiful light because you have a big, uh, basically a big diffuser by bouncing it off the walls on these actors, which would get a better uh, would would fit this dynamic range closer to within the sensor of the camera that they're using. So I wouldn't have to blow it out like that by just using yeah. a cheap light. So 
I'm showing you this video to show you if you're a colorist, walk away from it and come back because you might have went too far with it. And if you're a filmmaker, a cheap light at, from Home Depot could have made this scene so much better where the color colors wouldn't have to blow out your background, even though there wasn't much to see back there anyways. But uh, that's an easy fix for uh, cheap lighting to bounce some light into the scene. So that's yep. it, David. Well, the, you know, the funny thing is, too, you can also say the same thing about your, your photo editing, ed editing as well. Sometimes you can push it too far. If you go away before you post it, yeah, leave same it for thing. a while, come back, you think, oh, I might have taken it too far or I shouldn't have done this. It's amazing how, uh, like Jim said, eye fatigue, you know, you, you can change if you look at something a, a bit later on. So it's often good to wait um, and, you know, and do that. So, oh, thanks, Aaron. That was good. All right. You're so welcome. let's uh, open up just for Q&A. Uh, we'll just go through some questions if people had any um just seeing what's happening down here let me see where we were up to roughly so if you have any quick questions guys and you wanted to um ask any throw them away now or throw them at us <laughs> now i noticed dion said uh, oh jason Lanyon was arrested yeah he's been he's out now so he wasn't i don't think he'll even be charged because i don't he didn't do anything wrong but um what else have we got uh Scott said, I do the same. I set my zebras to 100% and adjust until they go away. I've noticed that there's some leeway uh, before it's actually blown out, even with the zebras at 100%. And we discussed that, that there is still a little bit of uh, a, a recovery that you can go that's past why, that 100. That's why I use 100 plus when I'm shooting on my Sony a7 III using RAW, because even at 100 plus, you're maximizing that dynamic range even more. So you could try 100 plus to go out and do some tests to see right when you at 100 plus when you see those zebras you could back it off a little bit you could still see a little bit dancing around on certain spots and, and you'll see that you'll get even more dynamic range yep um colin said he i set my uh the zebras at 95 percent for video so we all we all do different things and that's the let me the thing let me give you a point it depends on video i'm still working on my um uh picture profile settings which are basically uh almost perfect colors from what I can see with my eyeballs and my color chart, which is uh, pretty cool. And it's not, it's not, um, it's not S log where you have to use 800 ISO. And it's, it's basically, you can get it really quick input. I'm using that right now, actually. I don't know what it looks like through Skype and all this. And I'm using my, uh, 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 LUT that I made up on here too. But anyways, you can bring it back pretty quick and without having to use 800 ISO, you can bring it back pretty quick with a little bit of wiggling, wiggle room. And speaking about the 95%, it depends on what picture profile you use as well when it comes to zebras. Uh, because I noticed going through a lot of tests, depending on that gamma curve that you're using, that's going to dramatically make your um, zebra is drastically different. So if you're using 100 plus, let's say, and I, I, I don't remember which picture profiles do what, I did so many tests, but certain picture profiles, like this background right here, uh, whoops, let me see, right here at certain, let's say this was zebras dancing right here. Yep. On some picture profiles, you might see zebras way down in here, even though there's detail here or the opposite of that, where there is no uh, zebras telling you it's blowing out. So you got to be very careful. So if you're using, uh, doing it for photography, you could just use the standard profile. And that's what I was doing for most of my, uh, the standard JPEG, which will change uh, your zebras depending on what you use. So I'm glad you brought that up. I use standard for photography as just a base while I'm exposing for my raw photos but picture profiles in video mode definitely makes a difference so him using 95 probably depends on what picture profile settings he's using and what gamma curve yeah well trev made a good point too he said that uh, if you don't have waveforms both sony and panasonic provide documentation on exactly how to expose for s log and v log to maximize dynamic range and i said also if you like i said with leaming luts and if you buy some of these systems that that make the whole thing work very easily they tell you what settings to put in there as well because then it sort of cool. all works out automatically very good um, what else have we got uh, Scott said, uh, I have a peak design strap and always take it off all the time too. Um, Jeffrey said, I have the uh, waist strap. It's good. They said they don't see oh, the me. I don't strap, know what that sorry. means. Oh. Oh, hang on. Yeah, we're, we're on questions. No, we're only on questions. That's all. Oh, okay. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, none of us uh, are on it at the moment. Okay. I can pick um, my nose then. Yep. Yeah. Mark said, the spider <laughs> is great for uh, studio usage. Uh, 
Um, Jim said, I cannot uh, hang things on my belt. Jeans uh, would just fall to my ankles. And that's why I said <laughs> a lot of people have that. You said it's a senior uh, fat bottom, flat bottom, I should say. Um, David, did the black hole collapse on itself? Yeah, it's pointing backwards. <laughs> oh, where is it? <laughs> it's back here. Oh, yeah. I've got it pointing yeah. backwards there. So it's yeah, just, I see it. Yeah. Um, let me just bring back these questions just so people can it's see illuminating them. the wall. Um, bring the mic up. Which one? Mark, Aaron's or uh, mine? Um, what else have we got? Uh, Aaron, uh, oh, I said, uh, Aaron, yesterday was Star Wars Day, May the 4th. Please put your mask on and say, Luke, oh, I'm your yeah. father. <laughs> that thing right there. I've got it rigged with a light. I can't take it down. I oh, love it. Um, else mark said wedding will be over by the time it's all on that's what the belt you're talking about i usually put it on before and kerry usually yeah. sticks it on yeah. me actually you say by the time you get that on the wedding's over yeah, you I look okay it. ready oh crap it's <laughs> david is a parachute rigger i love it um black rabbit uh, black rabbit for the win, uh, black rapid for the win love those guys yeah i like black rapid uh stuff as well is that what you said you used on there yes yep that's the one that screws on the bottom yeah i've seen those a lot yep um, what else have we got? Jeffrey said, I like the strap Aaron has. Um, I own an EOSR that when the something goes over the eyepiece, uh, it changes the view piece mode, not the screen mode. Having a neck strap makes it fall over one eyepiece accidentally. Oh. Um, but he's just saying he likes the same as you anyway. Uh, what else? Yeah, it holds got? its form. It's really nice. You don't have to struggle with it. Laugh. They're all like Jim's laughing at me, putting trying to put that harness on. I yeah, they, you kept saying your bum and his bum and all these yeah. bums, so I kept laughing too. Yeah. <laughs> um, what else? Then they're just talking about the photo. Trev said, uh, Trev also said um, that should work with or without the tripod. He's talking about my image, and I said, no, you really do need to put it on a tripod because there will oh, be a yeah. fraction of movement. Yeah. So that that's the problem. If you're using flash, like you said, a little bit in there, like uh, I know you did dance dance photos, and I've done uh, 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 a gymnast, uh, gym, not gymnastics, uh, sports stars or whatever, in a controlled flash environment where I was using a slow shutter because I wanted to darken the darken the background. No, wait, how'd that work? Um, I was using a slow shutter for what purpose was I using a slow shutter for this one shoot? I don't remember, but the flash becomes your shutter speed, so. It's going to stop the action, but in, I think, your case, David, you couldn't do that because you're outside and there's too yeah, much light, right? there's too much so, light. Yeah, that would have been the issue. It would have still had some movement. If it was dark, you could probably get away with it. Yeah. Um, Jim also said, uh, do you mind summarizing what you showed me in Vegas through the histogram? And I was just trying to point out to him that uh, if you your histogram... You've got to be careful, though, because it also depends on the scene as well. But uh, like, for instance, if I was shooting in a low light scenario, I would try and push that histogram over as much as I possibly could, but still have the image look OK. Uh, but what I was trying to say to him is as long as you don't skip, you, you can just kiss that right hand side. You can go a fraction over, actually. And like I said, you can still recover those highlights back. But if you're dealing, say, in a high contrast scene like a wedding or something like that, and it was a bright, sunny day, I would push the highlights like the bride's dress uh, and things like that just, or even the sky, uh, push them just to going over just to that right-hand side of the histogram, and then you could uh, still recover it a little bit later. The other way of looking at it too, down the bottom of your um, camera screen, you'll get the, the readout that that will be showing as well. And you can go up to, say, around about point, uh, plus 0.5, uh, sorry, 0 0.5 so in other words you can not go a full stop over but if you go half a stop over uh, you'll get a reasonable result uh, when you bring that back a little bit later on but like i said it, it's hard to sort of talk about unless you're looking at it through the viewfinder and explaining it because every image i can show them right here yeah well i'll bring i'll show aaron in a second with uh, remember sometimes there is no highlight and there's no shadow so you can't just push it to the right and to the left all the time you've got to mm. balance it out by the image but I'll, I'll go over to aaron and he can uh take you through uh this as well so jim this is exactly what i'm just showing you what david just said so let's say uh, i'm over here and you're behind the camera and you want to take my photo here well th this is the histogram this is actually a color, but we'll just look at oh, either one. But let's look at this top one here. If, you, if you're on the back of the camera and you're adjusting all of your settings, your ISO and your shutter speed and aperture, whatever, and you're to the left, 
Well, you can see the image is dark. So if we brought that and you took the photo and we brought that photo in post-production, we would then have to raise it up and that's going to make all the, the noise reveal itself and it's going to look terrible. But if we took this shot and this was your camera histogram and you're looking at the back of your camera and you instead in your camera uh, exposed to the histogram that looks like this to the right, which is uh, TTR to the right, I guess, uh, that would be something more like this. Now we're more shifted to the right, which is giving us a much better exposure. And if we wanted to in post, then we could bring it down. And then all we're doing is hiding that noise and not revealing it. So that's what David is talking about. Just make sure your histogram is more over here. But of course, you don't want to put your histogram way over here on the back of the camera because naturally you're going to blow out. And if you're using zebras at 100 percent, those zebras would be dancing all over the place telling you like, hey, you've gone too far. So you can come down to where you don't see zebras, which will probably bring you right around here in this specific photo and just up here you'd see zebras but there's nothing we can do about that it's just it's blown out you'd have to use gels on that light or whatever okay that back um what else here i said anyone using the uh giant crane i'm not sure how you pronounce that uh i don't use that no so i can't the talk gimbal? about it yeah the gimbal yeah i i actually use version one i I got it on when it first came out, and I, that's the same one I still use today. I don't really find any need to upgrade it. It does exactly, uh, unless you're, I would, you know, if you're using heavier gear, maybe it doesn't work, but I don't use heavy cameras or lenses. So what do you so, yeah. use on it? Uh, what sort of weight are well, you the, putting on there? Well, the, se the Tamron, 70 to, uh, 28 to 75. Yep. And typically, though, I use the smaller uh, primes that I have, the, the Zeiss 55, the the Samyang lens 24, those are all small, dinky lenses, but the Tamron's probably the heaviest. I did try it on the Sony 24 to 105 F4, and it was way too heavy. Uh, you know, you, you be really careful, but it, you have to be so careful that it, your, your mind is on that and not the production, where I was trying to do a commercial, and it started, you know, going like this, and it, yeah, it was terrible. So, Sony 24 to 105 is a no-go. The Tamron... 28 to 75 is, is a go. It works uh, pretty good. Cool. Um, That's on version one of that crane. Yeah, Mark just said too that the audio, I'm a bit low and you're a bit high. We'll have to work on that next week. We'll check that. Um, whenever I use a strap uh, that hangs to the side, I'm always afraid it's going to smash into something while I'm walking. Yeah, you do have to be careful about that. That's, uh, yeah, that's the only thing with, with those straps for me. Uh, I'm like Gilbert. I don't think Gilbert's in here today, but we love to get on the ground and take shots. And if I had something like that, if I'm doing two cameras, if I had one camera and it's in my hand, of course not. But if I had two cameras hanging like that, oh man, that thing would be all dragging all over the ground. So I think it would be good for even a one camera person because if you're holding it, you can still do all your maneuvers and not have to worry about the strap hanging everywhere. If you're having two cameras hanging, for me, it would be a problem. But uh, the one sounds pretty good. Okay, so I tried to up the volume a little bit. Let me know if that's any better. Um, Mine was low or too high? Yours was too high. But, oh. oh, well, we'll, uh, we'll adjust it for next week. <laughs> um, what else have we got? Um, I'm going to use my uh, Z50 on it, so it's going to be low weight and on a gimbal. So, yeah, that, that gimbal probably will be fine then if that's the case. So I think it'll be okay. At $200, so um, that, that sounds like it's a reasonable price Is that, for that version gimbal. 1? Because if it is, it, I've had it for... Well, you can probably research when that first came out, and it, it works fine. Um, that's about it, I think. Uh, that's about it for today, guys. So I think we've uh, finished. Uh, like I said, we might try uh, during the week and just have a look and see if we can get something happening with Zoom or something or Meet or something like that to see if we can get around yes. these problems with um, Skype. But So has my busy. audio ever synced this whole episode? No, I don't think so. I think it's been uh -huh. out the whole time. So, wow. yeah, it's just weird. And it has to be Skype because, like I said, I'm I'm uh, okay or roughly close and, you, and you're out. So, and, you know, it's it's got to be Skype that's causing that. So we'll see if we can come up with a solution. Um, uh, yes, he said there might be a difference in the volume when switched audio inputs. Yeah, it could be that too. Then that might need to be balanced now all through. So we'll have a look at that too. Uh, yes, it's much more normalized now. Oh, thanks, Mark. Yep, so it's been fixed.
All right. Well, thanks cool. so much, everyone. Uh, any comments, leave down below. Like I said, Aaron will share this on his site too, so you uh, feel free to pop over there and have a look as well and put a comment in. Um, yeah, and yep. if you're watching this on my channel, leave comments. Tell us uh, more of maybe you want to see more of something or less of something on this behind the photo. Do you want to see more video, uh, more photo? I mean, just tell us what you would like to see because we, we are open to suggestions to uh, see what you guys like. Uh, uh, so please do give us a now, thumbs up, uh, like, subscribe, do all that good stuff too. That really helps us out. Now, Hero said that um, the uh, Zoom is, is great as well as Steamyard as well. But I, like I said, I think Zoom. I'd like to try that too because that seems to be a standard yeah. that's now being used out there. Maybe better, but we can only try it and see how it goes. Maybe we'll um, try it. So we'll give it a go. Um, anything coming up, Aaron, in the next few days? Uh, hopefully tomorrow I'm going to, well, maybe not tonight, it's like late, but maybe tomorrow I'll finish up my, uh, picture profile because so many people love my, uh, custom, uh, profile for JPEG straight out of a seven three. I've got tons of uh, likes on that and everybody comments say they like it. So I'm kind of doing a video one that I think a lot of people will like as well. If you don't like to shoot uh, S log and want a little bit of wiggle room, but yet have almost perfect uh, colors and uh, easy to fix and post. Um, and that's uh, what did Jim say? Aaron J Anderson do a uh, trace cert to each other's JP to see when the, where the latency occurs. I don't even know what that means. I'm lost. Uh, <laughs> What? <laughs> I've got no idea what that means, Jim. Yeah, Jim, Is it some technical. Over... Yeah, it might be some yeah. technical I'm thing. I'm a technical that you... guy, but not that yeah. technical. <laughs> um, well, I've got a few. Like I said, I've got a few videos coming up in the coming days, so stay tuned for those. I've um, got some great small gear? stuff. Can't wait to. Uh... Is it gear video? Yeah, gear. Yep. Yeah. So looking cool. forward to that. And I still do have the other videos I've got to do, like Ike's workshop and stuff. I just haven't had time to get around to it, but I will get around. I got to it. do that. Um, <clears throat> I did the uh, Nelson's. Uh, ghost town but i yep. still have yet to do the fire oh, the, valley fire, of fire yeah, yeah I've, I've got to do both of those shoots yet Jeez. so i'll have to get around to doing it so i'll yeah. see you on friday uh for the or thursday for your time for the usual sony alpha news and rumors um and apart from that guys um we'll see you all in the next video bye for now so long guys thank you i would say